Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Science of Monster Hunter. I'm very excited today to bring everybody a little lecture about the biology, anatomy, and uh, ecology of Doshaguma, one of the predators of the Windward Plains environment in Monster Hunter Wilds. So I have already done a short video uh, of Doshaguma. It's available on this YouTube channel as well as on my TikTok. Um, and I've talked about uh, the kind of reason behind the red coloration of its face. So Doshagama has a very noticeable bald red face that is pretty obviously inspired by the uh, bald head Yukari. Um, the color of the bear's skin in both of these animals changes color in response to the animal's health and its, uh, I guess, nutrient access. So animals that are eating well, more socially dominant, are going to have redder faces uh, and are therefore going to be more desirable mates. Uh, another really good example of this sort of thing is the bald sections of bird faces. So here is a Japanese red-crowned crane, uh, and here is a macaw. You can see they both have these very prominent bald sections on tops of their heads that mates can use to judge their color, particularly because the fur, or feathers in this case, of these animals um, are not colored with living um, pigment. These feathers won't degrade and decrease in color when the animal is in poor health because the coloration is structural uh, rather than like skin pigments. Skin pigments, your skin is constantly being shed. Uh, it's going to fall off and, and get lost. Uh, and then a new color will be informed not only by the pigments being produced, uh, but also by the uh, size and density of the blood vessels under the skin, which is what gives Doshagama and the bald-faced Ukari their uh, color. Uh, Doshagama has these very uh, large bear-like uh, clawed forelimbs. They have broad claws that are slightly curved uh, and are very similar to those of a grizzly bear. Uh, grizzly bear claws are primarily used for uh, digging, but they're also occasionally used for prey capture. They're not uh, necessarily weak or not strong enough to be used uh, to kill other animals, and Doshagama is definitely in a similar situation. These are pretty specialized digging paws, or at least very wide ones, that would help it uh, maintain stability on sand, uh, kind of like snowshoes, uh, and help it move around in the desert. Uh, but these claws are probably primarily used for uh, digging due to their kind of width and structure. Another use for these wide paws is uh, fish capture. Doshagama is known to eat fish when it's in the Scarlet Forest, uh, potentially also in the Windward Plains, though it has not been observed. The Windward Plains does have um, fish in the ecosystem that Doshagama could potentially eat, though it would probably be competing for fewer fish with a similar amount of aquatic predators like Gagios, which are known to be fish eaters. Um, this is very similar to brown bears, which are uh, very clearly a large inspiration for uh, Doshagama in terms of both their anatomy and behavior. Another similarity between Doshagama and brown bears are the shoulder hump. Doshagama and brown bears both have these large ridges on their shoulders that are made out of the infraspinous uh, and deltoid muscles, uh, and they give these animals like very, very powerful arms. In brown bears, uh, their arms need to be very strong because they do a lot of digging. They, they create huge nests for um, hibernation. Uh, however, with Doshagama, it seems to be actually kind of like a nest thief. Doshagama goes into the nests that are usually occupied by other kinds of monsters. So uh, Chemetris, which has a pretty distinct nest area where it drags a lot of the carcasses of animals that it uh, uh, either kills or finds uh, decaying into this sort of nest area. Uh, when Doshagama is in the area, it will actually chase the Chemetris out of there. Uh, and then uh, occupy that and sleep as a group. So Doshagama doesn't really seem to be using these claws to dig nests, though it is possible. Um, it, it might be a burrowing animal. Maybe that's why we don't see any Doshagama young, because they're hiding in the burrow and the parents will bring food back to them. Uh, this is just speculation, though, so we don't really have any hard evidence as to uh, whether or not Doshagama does or does not dig uh, nests or dens. Doshagama has a long tail that's very flexible and covered with uh, very coarse hair. Um, it also sits right above this giant sort of dark red pubic hair patch that is definitely some sort of reproductive function. Uh, maybe it traps uh, scent or uh, some other sort of uh, chemical that allows Doshagama to broadcast the reproductive avail availability. That's just something that I noticed and I thought it was a cool detail. Um, the tail itself is probably a fly swatter. Doshagama is heavily parasitized. If you follow a Doshagama around in the Windward Plains, it's very easy to see uh, there are these clouds of insects that will buzz around it. Uh, and that can be very, very annoying, very aggravating, and also potentially deadly for some animals because those insects will transmit disease if they're blood sucking. Um, and so for Doshagama, having that mechanism behind it to kind of swat insects away from the tender parts of its body, insects are going to go for the areas that are uh, covered in less skin. 
It obviously has its paws to get insects away from its face, but these hindquarters have much shorter hair than the rest of the body, and so having uh, a fly swatter to kind of uh, hit insects away from these tender spots is going to be very, very helpful for an animal like Doshagum. It's going to reduce the risk of disease transmission, uh, and it will, in general, just make the animal's life much less aggravating. Doshagama has uh, incredibly bizarre cranial anatomy. Uh, it has a super, super strange specialized head that's not similar to a lot of the other fang beasts that we've seen. Uh, it has this great big nasal cavity combined with these two uh, post-orbital bosses on top of its head. Um, and then it has these teeny tiny eyes that are set uh, directly to the side. They're not facing forward like you would expect to see in most predatory animals. So Doshagama does not have uh, a lot, if at all, any binocular vision. Uh, it also has these giant tusks. Um, these are primarily used for prey capture, but they might also be used in intraspecific combat. So two Doshagamas will fight each other and they'll try to bite each other with their tusks, um, which could explain why they're exposed to the air so that other Doshagama can see how large they are and use them as a method of judging social standing. And they also have these crazy like shaggy lips that kind of hang off their head. Uh, now I talked a lot about kind of the function of the Doshagama skin in my previous video, so I'm not gonna go over that a ton, um, but I will. Uh, go on and talk about these sort of big bony bumps on top of its head because I think they're very interesting. The best example of this sort of structure in an animal is the kind of head bumps of Pachyrhinosaurus. These are called bosses, and they're constructed primarily of bone with a keratin layer on top, just like Doshagama's horns. Um, and you can see there are these kind of flat, blunt uh, knobs that kind of go all over the head. These are pretty common among ceratopsians uh, that don't have horns above their brows, but Pachyrhinosaurus is the only one that has it on its nose. In fact, that's what Pachyrhinosaurus means. It means thick-nosed lizard, even though it's not a lizard. Um, these bosses are maybe used for combat, they're maybe just for display. Either way, they definitely served a sexual function because uh, they're a really, really bizarre feature that uh, seems like it only exists because it assists with reproductive selection. Um, they are also very much an indicator of nutrient intake and just the health of an animal because more keratin is going to be able to grow if you take in more nutrients during uh, the period of the year where you're not growing these horns and also the period of the year where you are. This is one of the reasons why um, deer eat other deer. It's so that they can retake those nutrients into their body and grow larger antlers, which is why you should not remove roadkill if you're not permitted to do so because that's really important food for other male deer um, and they will not be able to grow their antlers nearly as large if they don't have access to that very, very important source of nutrients. So a uh, little bit of advocacy here, please don't take roadkill off the street if you're not permitted to. Uh, Doshagama has a really, really well-developed nose, uh, and I think this is really interesting. It's a desert animal, um, and desert animals tend to have very, very complex like nasal turbinate systems. Um, that's what these are. These are these little folds of bones that sit inside your nose, um, and they don't really help with scent all that much as far as I'm aware. What they do help with is temperature regulation and prevention of moisture loss. So, uh, you know, as air is flowing through here, it's going to get jumbled around and it'll kind of adjust to the temperature of your uh, skull as it's moving through all these blood vessels. It'll uh, basically go from being whatever temperature is outside of your head to being whatever temperature is inside of your head by the time it reaches the brain and lungs so that it doesn't give you like a brain freeze when you're breathing in a cold environment and it doesn't overheat your body when you're breathing in a hot environment. Um, in desert animals, they're also uh, known to prevent moisture loss, like I said. Uh, the chemistry behind that is a little bit complicated and I'm not exactly sure how it happens. So there is a paper down here that talks about it and I will suggest everybody go read that. Like I said on the previous slide, Doshagama has a really, really well-developed nose, and that is either a cause or a consequence of its eyes being really, really teeny tiny. It's primarily a scent-based predator. You can see it kind of standing up to sniff at a wider range uh, in the windward plains when the wind is blowing, um, and that is probably, uh, in my opinion, a reason behind why the eyes are so small. Um, they lack eyelashes completely as well, which makes them uh, kind of have to be small because big eyes are going to be uh, very unprotected if they don't have any eyelashes. Small eyes are still unprotected, but they're less likely to get damaged. Um, they also face to the side, which means that they're really unlikely to be used in sort of uh, short distance prey acquisition. Uh, predatory animals oftentimes have eyes that faced forward for reasons that we'll get into. In most cases, we expect uh, predators to have forward-facing eyes with binocular vision, and that's because a lot of predatory animals need to position their prey in 3D space to accurately strike at and kill them. However, Doshagama doesn't really seem to have a need to do this, primarily because it's going after relatively large prey, uh, and also attacking prey in groups where precise target selection isn't super important. 
Um, Doshagama's prey, Saratnoth, which is its like main prey item, is very, very big. And so as long as Doshagama is close to that Saratnoth and kind of biting in its general direction, it doesn't really need to see that Saratnoth so, so well, um, especially considering that oftentimes it's in a sandstorm where vision is really subpar. Um, but why does Doshagama not just have kind of uh, poor forward-facing vision if it's still a predatory animal? Well, Doshagama's eyes can be positioned to the side for a variety of reasons. Um, the biggest one that I think uh, is they are preventing damage from the incoming sandstorms. So if Doshagama has forward-facing eyes without those eyelashes, it's just going to have to close its eyes all, time, all the day, every time, whatever that means, all the time, every day. Um, and when it has these side-facing eyes and those big nasal bosses um, and a, a big, like, kind of pad of tissue around its eyes and that wrinkly skin, the sand is going to get, uh, like, deflected away from them and the eye is going to be fine. But if Doshagama had forward-facing eyes on the front of its face and it looked kind of weird and stupid like that, uh, the sand is going to go straight into its eyes when it's in a sandstorm and it's going to be blinded for life because it has no eyelashes to protect them. Um, another point is that the eyes are small because of a lack of eyelashes. Uh, small eyes are much easier to uh, protect um, with just the eyelids than uh, big ones. A wide spacing of the eyes also allows for a very wide field of view. This is particularly true of hammerhead sharks. They have these very wide set eyes um, and they also hunt with a method other than sight. This big kind of uh, bonnet on the front of their head, the, the hammer of the hammerhead shark, so to speak, um, is full of uh, electrically sensitive uh, tissue, and they'll use that to pinpoint their prey. So like Doshagama, it's using a sense other than sight to uh, capture its prey. Um, sideways facing eyes are in no way exclusive to prey animals, and forward facing eyes are not exclusive to predators. There are loads of prey animals that have um, forward facing eyes, most notably some hadrosaurian uh, dinosaurs, um, which could definitely look straight at you, uh, which is kind of interesting to think about. Doshagama has really, really interesting teeth. I noticed that when I killed a Doshagama and its mouth hung open, um, it has these uh, many, many different kinds of teeth. Heterodont dentition is very common uh, in mammals compared to reptiles. Doshagama seems very mammalian inspired in terms of its anatomy, uh, and it has a variety of kinds of teeth that I'm going to go over here. So it has these one pointed teeth um, on the top of its mouth that are kind of bladed and seem to be used for cutting and tearing flesh. Um, it has these two pointed teeth that are used either for crushing or uh, piercing and holding. I think these ones probably are more for crushing because of where they're situated in the back of the mouth. Uh, it has these big giant tusks, which seem to be very similar to the saber teeth of uh, like Smilodon and Gorgonopsids, uh, where they're being used in prey capture. Um, and then it also has these piercing and holding teeth on the bottom of its mouth that are both single and double pointed, but they're very sharp and they don't seem to have like a bladed edge like these cutting teeth up here. Um, lots of animals have teeth with multiple points on them that are not just molars. Um, these are frilled shark teeth. They have three uh, points on them, and they look pretty similar to a lot of Doshagama's piercing teeth. Um, I think that's pretty cool, and I think it is a really, really interesting example of creature design. You don't really often see like bizarre teeth included in monster designs, and I'm happy that the team did it with Doshagama. It's super cool. Uh, one thing that I find very interesting about Doshagama is its hunting behavior. Um, they don't share food, and I'll get into why in a bit. Um, they mostly attack medium to large herbivores, uh, and they primarily kill with their teeth. A lot of the herbivores and uh, carnivores in the Windward Plains are armored, and so having these kind of large piercing teeth is going to help get through that. Um, it's talked about in the lore of the games that Doshagama teeth are specialized for piercing armor, if you look at the item description, um, which makes sense because a lot of the time they're going after Saratnoth, and in the cutscene sometimes uh, Balahara, which are both very, very large armored animals, that having those piercing fangs is going to be an important uh, adaptation for uh, like killing them. Doshagama don't share food, like I said, and that's because they don't really live in packs, despite what the game calls it. They're doing what is called predator mobbing, which predators kind of do when there's an abundance of food and they just kind of get together because being in a large group, and even if you're working independently, uh, is going to make killing easier. So a bunch of Doshagama will converge on a pack of Saratanoth and they'll, uh, they'll all go kind of independently hunt and kill them, and then they'll all eat their own food afterward. Um, they sometimes try to steal food from each other, but they are very, very anti-sharing. They're not a cohesive social group. They form and then disperse very rapidly uh, seasonally, so it's not really a, a pack lifestyle as is described in like 
uh, wolves and other very social animals like Harris hawks. They're not coordinated at all. Um, they're they're very independently acting, and they just all happen to be in the same place and uh, not. I, I hesitate to say not even fighting each other because they're almost antagonistic to each other when they're in these groups. Um, it's a it's a really bizarre and very interesting um, kind of social structure. That kind of non-cooperative hunting behavior um, is uh, not unprecedented, though, even though it is kind of bizarre. Uh, Komodo dragons uh, and Cuban crocodiles here, I think most species of crocodilians uh, do some kind of mobbing when uh, food is abundant, um, but they're doing kind of independent hunting, but just all in the same place at the same time, and it does make prey capture easier. So Komodo dragons will all go after like one wildebeest, and they won't really uh, evenly partition it or share. A lot of the times these mobs are made exclusively of adult animals because juveniles aren't going Going to be able to access any of the food they kill um, because the adults will just take it away from them because they're larger and stronger, um, which is one of the distinctions between mobs and packs is that in packs we tend to look for animals with multiple ages um, as opposed to um, mobs where they're basically all going to be adults, which is what we find at like Deinonychus kill sites and uh, you know the, the Midwestern United States. Deinonychus is an animal that's often depicted as being a pack hunter, but uh, a lot of the Deinonychus fossil beds are exclusively adults, which means that they're probably not living in like cohesive family groups so much as getting together when food is there. So yeah, that's my little page of Doshagama that I, uh, I sketched up after uh, playing the game for a little bit. Um, I did also want to go over the etymology of its name. Uh, it's called Calvashus Erebuscus. Um, Calva is from the Latin uh, word for bald. Shush is the Dene word for bear because uh, Doshagama looks like a bear, and uh, a lot of the elements of like Kunafan culture are pretty inspired by uh, Dene culture, but maybe I'm just projecting a little bit there. Um, and Erebuscus uh, is Latin for blushing because its face blushes red. A huge, huge thank you to all of my supporters for allowing me to make this content. Uh, that's a big thank you to Splift, DJ, Pierre Watt, Brandon Rutherford, Cake Chad the Vast, Brick Floats More, and Joe Evans and Ian. Uh, I would not be able to do this without all you guys, and I sincerely appreciate all your support. Um, a lot of these people have very, very cool opinions that influence my videos in my Discord, uh, and they're great at sharing ideas. So thank you so much to you guys. I really, really appreciate it. Please feel free to put any questions you have in the comments below. I will cover them either in a response or in a future video uh, if they're uh, complicated enough. I really, really do appreciate everyone's opinions, and I love, love hearing what you guys have to say, whether or not it agrees with uh, my conclusions about these animals, because science is a collaborative process, and uh, it's never best when done alone. So please, please uh, do not hesitate to share your opinions or ask questions in the comments. Uh, I love hearing everything, and I... Uh, I'm excited to hear what all you folks have to think about this video.